The Red Army, which just a few short weeks before had gone home, was back. The Czechs and the free world had not anticipated this. But the hammer and sickle had returned to pound and cut the Czechs' hopes of a liberal, self-governing communist way of life. The train bringing Soviet leaders to the small Czech town of Cherna very, very recently had also brought hope. They were prepared to talk to the free-minded new Czech government, come to terms. The world watched. Premier Kosygin gave every appearance of friendship. The atmosphere was cordial but tinged with a degree of reserve as the Russians and Czechs made for the conference table. The setting was unglamorous, a small town club which housed the local cinema. At last they faced each other to thrash out their problems. For the Russians, Podgorny, Brezhnev, Kosygin, Zuslov, across the table, Dubček, President Svoboda and Josef Smokovsky. Would the Russians accept the Czech break from the Kremlin line? They talked and talked. Behind locked doors, the reformist Czechs struggled to convince the Kremlin hierarchy of their loyalty, despite their wish for freedom. After four days, it was over. The Russians emerged, followed by the Czechs. Party chief Alexander Dubček and his colleagues were in good spirits. The nation saw hope in their smiles. Josef Smokovsky gave happy reassurance, as did President Svoboda. From Cherna, they went to Bratislava for a meeting with the signatories of the Warsaw Pact. The world's press was there. Excitement mounted. For here, the Pact countries would sign a joint declaration granting the Czechs freedom. But first, there was a visit to the unknown Red Soldier Memorial, one of the many who had fallen liberating Czechoslovakia from the Nazis. That night in the Czech capital, thousands rejoiced in their newfound free way of life. Their heroes were the men who had spoken for them at the conference table. How they welcomed them home. Western and Czech journalists clamoured for statements. Dubček and his team had achieved a kind of success which had set not only their own country but the rest of the world on a firm path to peaceful coexistence. The Russians, through their attitude, had won considerable prestige with the West. Communism, it seemed, was at last unbending. The Cold War had lost a lot of its iciness when just a few hours earlier the Russian leaders had taken leave with warm farewells, smiling, carrying flowers of friendship and with kisses for their Czech comrades. But so soon did the smiles disappear, the flowers wilt, and the kissed cheeks turn away. The shocking, unexpected news was of crisis proportions. Stunned people gathered in Downing Street. They do at times like this. But it was at the Czech Embassy where the full weight of Russian pressure was felt. Inside, people just stood silently or talked in small groups. The Russian embassy was a gaunt, isolated place, cut off by a protective police court. Only the press had got through. Russia had acted in the best interests of the Czechs, they were told. Those who waited in the streets disagreed, emphatically. Large, angry crowds found a target for their bitterness at Earl's Court, the Russian exhibition. Police stopped them getting in, but they stayed to demonstrate, echoing the feelings of millions. Czechs, Britons, Americans, so many nationalities of cosmopolitan London tried to find an outlet for their anguish. Then another blow. Mr. Wilson recalled his cabinet. Parliament, too, was called back. It was an emergency situation. Michael Stewart, Foreign Secretary, and Minister of Defence, Dennis Healy, led their colleagues to the cabinet room. Even as they assembled, reports were coming in of street fighting and strong resistance in Prague and throughout the Czech nation. Throughout the West, leader after leader spoke for their people in deploring the Russian invasion. Seats of government were rocked by the massive setback in East-West relations. An emergency meeting of the UN Security Council was called, but the damage has already been done.